good afternoon and welcome to all of you uh, on behalf of Francesco Pignatelli, the ELISA Action Leader and Senior Program Manager, on behalf of uh, Lorena Hernandez, Project Officer and responsible for the knowledge transfer on ELISA Action, and myself, uh, Simon Vrecher, a consultant supporting ELISA Action, all of us working for the European Commission's Joint Research Center. Today uh, is Thursday, and as usual, we'll be hosting another webinar in the series of uh, ELISA webinars. Today with the title, uh, European Union Location Framework, Blueprint, its role and how to use it. So maybe as you can see on the next slide, uh, first a few words about ELISA for those who don't know. Uh, ELISA stands for European Location Interoperability Solutions uh, for e-government and is a part of the ISA Square program, uh, a European interoperability program, actually, which is uh, aiming at providing cross-border and cross-sector interoperability solutions uh, for public administrations, businesses and citizens. There are 54 different actions tackling interoperability from different angles, while ELISA action is the only one focusing on the location dimension aiming to, as you can see on the next slide, supporting different policy initiatives at European and, and uh, national levels, uh, providing uh, reusable, interoperable, cross-border and uh, cross-sector frameworks and solutions for public administrations, uh, businesses and citizens, uh, discovering uh, how emerging trends and technologies enable uh, more uh, effective use of location data for policy and digital public services and providing knowledge transfer to inform and train stakeholders and promote uh, the adoption of uh, good practices and innovation in location data. Uh, as you can see on the next slide, so within the context of ELISA knowledge transfer activities, uh, we are uh, organizing uh, periodically webinars uh, to engage in an agile way uh, with topics of relevance to the digital transformation and uh, showcasing and promoting ELISA's uh, consolidated uh, uh, results uh, of actions uh, and activities. Uh, the latter will be also the aim of today's webinar, in which, as you can see on the next slide, our speaker, uh, Ray Bogoslavsky, uh, external consultant at the uh, European Commission's Joint Research Center, will uh, guide us through the ULF blueprint and show us how it can be used to answer some of the key questions, uh, optimizing the use of location information in digital government uh, now and in the future. Uh, as you will see later, uh, we'll keep the event uh, as interactive as possible. So participants will be invited to give their views uh, and ask the questions on how to uh, good practices in the blueprint are applied in their organizations and countries. So that will be done during the webinar and at the end as well. But now, Ray, please uh, share with us uh, what would be for a starter, main course and the search for today's webinar. Please, Ray. Okay, thank you, Simon. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased you're able to uh, attend this uh, webinar. Uh, well, the starter uh, on the menu today is uh, a discussion on the role and scope of the, the blueprint. Uh, and followed by um, uh, some, some questions uh, relating to its relevance. Uh, the main course, uh, we'll be looking into how to use the blueprint and again, uh, get some uh, views from, uh, from everyone. And dessert will be some conclusions and next steps, which uh, uh, where we'll draw together the main messages and, uh, and try to get some ideas for the, for the future. So that, that's uh, what we'll cover today. Okay, thank you, Ray. So before going for a starter, so let's maybe see uh, where are you from? So what is your affiliation? So please start with the, with the old poll. So whether are you coming from EU public administration, national public administration, regional local public administration, are you from academia research? Are you maybe from the small or medium enterprise, large enterprise? self-employed consultant, non-governmental organization, citizen or private person or other. If we uh, forget something, please <laughs> let us know in the chat box what is what means other. <laughs> we'll be very curious. <laughs> so let's uh, have a 10, 15 seconds to get your polling and votes. 
will be also, I think, good input for, uh, for Ray. Okay, so let's end and share the results. So it's obvious that the most of you are from the National Public Administration. Uh, and then the, the rest of you, it's a bit of the regional local public administration as well. Uh, EU public administration, small and media enterprises. So Ray, I think you have now a good insight of our audience. So please start with a starter. Okay, we'll start with the, um, uh, the role of the EU left blueprint in the context of European digital and data strategy. So getting to the basics, what, what is the blueprint? Uh, it's a location interoperability framework for Europe with recommendations and guidance for the exchange and use of location information in the context of government policy and digital public services. And it's linked closely with the interoperability principles and the scope of the European interoperability framework. In terms of numbers, there are five focus areas in the blueprint, 19 recommendations. It covers uh, six roles uh, that we've identified and cross reference to those focus areas and recommendations. And we currently highlight 49 best practices and link those again to the, the focus areas and recommendations. Uh, and we're looking for more. In terms of uh, uh, the way you can access the blueprint, you can either look at a published document and download it, or you can review the online content. Uh, and on the online side, we're increasingly investing more on that side of uh, the blueprint. So it's a location interoperability framework, uh, but what is location interoperability? Uh, we have this uh, short guiding definition, which is a general definition around uh, the ability of organizations, systems and devices to exchange and make use of location data, uh, emphasizing the coherent and consistent approach in doing that. And of course, in a digital government context, which we're talking about, there are contextual aspects to, to add to that as well. But in simple terms, that's the definition we use. As far as the, the blueprints uh, uh, lifespan, uh, it has uh, existed for a number of years and uh, continually evolved and maintained its relevance through the life of the ISA and ISA squared programs and uh, through the evolution of, of SDIs and moving to uh, location enabling e-government services and today more sophisticated location intelligence supporting digital government. And we hope to continue that uh, evolution and maintain the relevance of the EULF through the Digital Europe program and have plans uh, with uh, an, a follow on elite action to the ELISE action, which we're currently running. We'll tell you a little more about that later. In terms of the aims of the blueprint, uh, th this slide uh, lays those out, firstly, in terms of translating new developments in policy and technology and giving a location perspective on those developments and translating them in a practical way for, uh, uh, for those involved in uh, location related activities. And there are many policies and we try to join those up as far as possible in terms of data and digital policies. Uh, the EU perspective and the member state perspective and both national and uh, local perspectives on, uh, on these matters. We try to improve understanding uh, we, by understanding the challenges and the opportunities faced by all parties and we try to explain things as, uh, as clearly and helpfully as possible. The outputs are in the form of guidance and we uh, we, have, we produce a toolbox of recommendations and associated guidance. And the idea is to use that selectively rather than read from beginning to, to, to end. And we'll show you how to do that later. We also aim to share best practices, collect and share best practices in terms of coordination activities and particular use cases at all levels of government and in different sectors. And those are to illustrate the guidance and support reuse and uh, collaboration activities. 
And all of this in, is in the context of uh, location data uh, in digital government. And we try always to put the users of digital public services and data at the center of the framework. The framework is a balanced framework for providers and users, but we really aim to take that uh, user focus on the, on the guidance. Looking at the uh, policy context and, and, how, and what we need to consider and, and how we do that, uh, there's a lot of relevant policy here in terms of data policy, digital policy, policy at a sector level, and policy relating to the EU and, and parts of the EU. And uh, all of that has a location dimension uh, that we attempt to un uh, understand and draw together uh, in terms of concrete, uh, practical uh, understanding and guidance. Within the guidance, we deal with uh, several main themes. I mentioned the, the user focus, so we focus on user needs. We focus on value creation and uh, activities to support collaboration. Uh, we focus on innovation and promoting and supporting innovation, integrating across different levels of government, um, integrated policy uh, approaches, integration within, uh, uh, within the data infrastructure and between location data and other data. And very importantly, we focus on awareness raising and skills as part of the framework. In terms of, the, uh, uh, in, in terms of aiding understanding, uh, we attempt to translate new developments and uh, uh, new phrases that, uh, that you may hear about or, or may be developing. Recent data policy developments have introduced the concepts of data spaces. So we position those in relation to spatial data infrastructures. We see, we see evolving ecosystems in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of providing, sharing and using data. Many parties collecting together in those ecosystems. And we explain how uh, the nature of ecosystems and how those relate to, uh, uh, to uh, the overall scheme. So this is an example from the blueprint of uh, some of the explanations that we provide. I'll now look at the scope of the blueprint and uh, what it contains and some of the key messages to give you a little more detail. So firstly, uh, the uh, location interoperability elements, the main elements within the blueprint and within the LEAS are shown here. So the blueprint, uh, I mentioned it, it relates to the uh, European interoperability framework and, in, and it reflects the interoperability principles and the scope of the EIF as a domain interoperability framework for location. You see the structure there. Uh, the blueprint uh, is, sits alongside the location interoperability framework observatory that I also talk about. This is a, a monitoring process that we, we run uh, that monitors the adoption of the recommendations and good practices in the blueprint. The blueprint also forms the scope for our knowledge transfer activities and the observatory uh, is uh, an observatory for location, but it also shares information with the EIF's own observatory, uh, the National Interoperability Framework Observatory. And at an architectural level, and in terms of uh, the assets that are created across Europe, uh, we, feed it, we, uh, uh, we link to and apply uh, the architectural framework of the European Interoperability Architecture Framework, and we attempt to collect best practices and share them uh, with the uh, cataloging activities of, um, of the EIF. And uh, all of this activity generates uh, a lot of new terms and we try and, uh, and, and reuses a lot of terms and we, uh, and we store those and, uh, and share those through the ELISE glossary which is part of the online service. So going down into a little more detail, the five areas, five focus areas of the blueprint are shown here. 
policy and strategy alignment, digital government integration, standardization, and reuse, return on investment, and governance, partnerships, and capabilities. These all frame the uh, ELISE activities where we undertake uh, benchmarking, provide guidance, uh, have knowledge transfer activities. We develop studies that uh, carry out studies on particular topics in these areas. And we uh, develop solutions that, um, uh, that are testing out principles and developing products uh, that, uh, that uh, apply the good practices in the framework. The five uh, focus areas uh, are, cover a number of topics, and these are the range of topics that are covered within the blueprint recommendations and also within the monitoring indicators in the observatory. So as you can see in looking at that, there's quite a rich degree of, uh, of guidance covered in the blueprint. I'll go th through uh, an example here of the, uh, one of the themes that I mentioned, the key theme of, uh, of the user focus of the blueprint. Within uh, the, the, the recent release of the blueprint, we created a forward which has uh, described the blueprint for a user-driven spatial data infrastructure. And you'll see in there a summary of the good practices in the blueprint and highlighting where the, the, the user focus of the blueprint is, is applied. And I've taken some examples from here so you can see some of the example practices that we discuss and describe and form part of the, the blueprint. So these include, for example, uh, users involved in the governance processes, a user-centric approach on digital public service design and delivery and, and feedback on those services, and promoting innovation and reuse by engagement between the public sector and the, and the private sector. So some examples there of the user-driven focus in the uh, SDI for the SDI. And uh, I'll finish off this section by um, saying something about the observatory. You'll see here some of the outputs from the observatory. We produce um, uh, country fact sheets based on responses to a questionnaire, an overall European state of play report. And you'll see here some of the, the graphics that we, uh, we include as part of the observatory. Uh, the first run of the observatory was in 2019, where we had uh, 10 countries, and we're currently engaged with 23 countries for LIFO 2020. And uh, you will see the, the outputs from uh, that in the coming months, and a follow-up webinar as well to, uh, to look at the results. So I'll finish uh, this section, and uh, we can uh, go into Q&A on this. Discussion. Yes, thank you, Ray, for, for this uh, starting, uh, starting part of the presentation. It's a part of a bit of a discussion. Uh, I'll check if there are some questions in the box. I think there were some about the definitions, which I already answered during, the, during your presentation. But maybe before to continue, uh, Ray, a question to you. So why, why the, 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 the blueprint was developed? So does it offer any, anything unique? Uh, can you explain this a bit, a bit more? Well, we developed the, the blueprint uh, because there, there wasn't anything out there uh, that's uh, covering the, the context of the use of location information in digital government. And uh, as we developed it, we, we developed it and, uh, and had it further unique features. The user focus came out as being uh, particularly important. Uh, we focused on interoperability, and uh, that is uh, a distinction from, from a location perspective from, uh, uh, from the EIF. And, and also, uh, very few frameworks uh, are, are set up in the inter interactive way that we've, uh, we've created the, the, the blueprint. We, we aim to make the blueprint itself as, uh, as usable as, as possible. And, and also uh, frameworks uh, 
aren't always used for benchmarking. And our intention was always to, to focus the, uh, the, the, uh, the blueprint uh, or to complement the blueprint with a, with, a, with a benchmarking process. So combine all those and uh, we see the, um, the uni unique nature of the blueprint. Okay, thank you, Ray, for, for elaborating this, that more in details, in particular for those who are maybe less familiar uh, with the blueprint and also the process, how it uh, evolved. Uh, but I'm uh, pretty much aware that here today are also some of them that are maybe more familiar with the, with the blueprints, especially in the, some member states, uh, public administration. So maybe a uh, question here, uh, does the blueprint focus on the most important topic for topics for the European public administration. And maybe challenge this question to Tomáš Pitek from Slovenia. Thank you, Simon. Do you hear me? Um, yes. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I'm quite familiar with uh, the conclusion that uh, Blueprint focused uh, the most important topics for uh, European public administration. Uh, why? I think uh, that uh, it's, it's the reason is that uh, the document uh, became uh, a live document, so it's updated and uh, touched all these important focus areas. So my opinion is that uh, the blueprint uh, cover the uh, merging process between geospatial man data management and uh, e-government uh, processes and help us to be as a data provider or service provider uh, agencies to be more visible within the public administration. And uh, with usage of uh, all these uh, uh, recommendations uh, read, written into the uh, 19 recommendations written into the blueprint uh, document, uh, it is uh, sometimes, sometimes easy to bring uh, together all stakeholders in the national level and uh, convince them to be uh, familiar with uh, urgent need for inter inter interoperability of public administration on the national and of course also on the European level. So yes, my opinion regarding the um, topics which is covered within the uh, blueprint and the focus area is that uh, is covering the mo all the important and uh, interesting uh, areas. But there is always some but. Sometimes I uh, feel that it, it's more or less communicated within the uh, convinced uh, stakeholders. So uh, I'm not sure is the, if the process is coming out of the box enough. So uh, to touch the um, stakeholders and the decision makers uh, out of the so-called location uh, data processes. So uh, this is my, uh, my personal uh, opinion regarding this. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tomas, for sharing this uh, with us and all the participants. Um, uh, Ray mentioned before also the um, European interoperability framework. So um, here and, and the, in the blueprint as a domain interoperability framework. So maybe the question would be relevant for, the, for someone from uh, familiar with the EIF. So what blueprint uh, brings alongside the European interoperability framework? I think we have, uh, we have uh, yes, Federico Chiarelli here. So Federico, maybe uh, if you can elaborate a bit on that. Hello, Simon, and Thank, uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, just a short introduction just to, to frame the relation between uh, uh, the different uh, domain, uh, domain interoperability framework and the EIF. Basically, the EIF positions itself in the intersection between the different national interoperability framework of the member states and uh, the domain uh, interoperability uh, uh, framework. So because of its nature, some of the recommendations are a bit high level because uh, they have to be transversal to the different domain as well as uh, fit uh, every uh, member state's uh, peculiarities. So in this, this regard, the added value of uh, the, uh, the, the blueprint is that uh, 
provides concrete uh, recommendation on how to implement uh, some of the more generic one of the uh, of the European interoperability framework. And additionally, uh, the the the, uh, the great value is that uh, for the way in which the blueprint is uh, is built uh, and the AIF as well, it's possible to map each other recommendation and see how they relate each other and uh, how different member states can uh, uh, try to implement uh, one recommendation of the blueprint and at the same time uh, reaching the implementation of another uh, recommendation of the EIF. So in this regard, uh, I would say that uh, uh, these two frameworks are um, complementary and they support each other uh, um, implementation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Federico. So now we have uh, seen the relations toward the European public administrations, the, 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 the general interoperability framework, European inter interoperability framework. So maybe now would be the place for the question um, uh, how uh, location interoperability framework can help uh, um, different uh, uh, smart communities, for example. Uh, here, I think we have a uh, Andrea Halmos here as well. Maybe you could uh, comment uh, something on that. Please, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Indeed, I work at the, uh, the Commission in the Smart Cities Unit in DG Connect. So we've been uh, uh, very much uh, looking at how interoperability and the European interoperability framework could benefit also from uh, also smart cities and communities. And uh, in fact, what uh, you have done here, it could be a very uh, important integral part of that because for many, for all the uh, smart uh, cities and communities uh, solutions, um, location information is key. Uh, so uh, we are currently uh, developing with the smart cities, for example, a data space for data sharing among uh, cities and communities. We're looking at how uh, cities could benefit uh, from so-called local digital, <clears throat> digital twins. And we do see that in many cases, these digital twins start out of, for example, the GIS departments in cities. So I think there is a huge potential here uh, to benefit from your findings, your recommendations, and as well as the blueprint, because as I said, uh, for any uh, decision in a smart city context or any service in a smart city context, location information will be key. Thank you very much, Andrea, for sharing your thoughts. Um, maybe if there will be something we have here, also Ricardo, I think, uh, from uh, Vitorino, from, from Ubiver, maybe to add something on top of that regarding the smart communities from the, from the provider's perspective. Uh, absolutely, Simon. Thank you for, for the opportunity. So um, just to give a brief context, uh, I work at Ubiware. We are a software development SME uh, that develops solutions for smart cities and telecom operators. So we are part of the industry, but we also work with ETSI, uh, so the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, uh, in several contexts. So we are able, even as a small enterprise, to work on the standardization uh, aspect of data exchange uh, and implementing best practices for reuse of technology that allows end users as public authorities and digital governments not to be locked to a vendor, be it uh, Ubiware or other, other player, so that they can integrate different systems and uh, ensure openness and interoperability. And one of the things that we've uh, noticed uh, within Etsy is that there's this gap between the citizen needs and then the, the industry specification uh, activities. So the more we can reduce this gap and bring the needs in terms of privacy preserving, accessibility, usability, and other concerns that are useful not only for technology innovation, so heading towards uh, 5G, heading towards artificial intelligence, heading towards the innovation that Europe so, so well pushes um, uh, within the community, I, I believe that uh, the better we are suited. So I, I believe that a, a framework like this, a blueprint like this, where you bring to the table the different stakeholders and uh, where you can hear the, the voices of uh, from the needs and from the, uh, the offers, I think it's uh, a very nice approach. And the more we can learn, not only from the success stories, but also from uh, the, the, the challenges faced, I think uh, the best we, we can improve our, our processes, uh, both in the industry side and in the public government. Thank you, Simon. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, as well to you. So thank you all to, to Ray, Tomas, Federico, Andre, and Ricardo here for um, giving her views and maybe to clarify uh, some things of the, um, on, the, on the blueprint and its, uh, its relevance. So maybe before, uh, there are some questions already, I think in the, in the chat box as I see, but I think uh, some of them would be uh, answered uh, uh, directly during the main course. If not, that we will be will be uh, left uh, till the end uh, uh, to see if there are still unclear. So please, uh, Ray, continue with the main course. Okay, thank you for those uh, contributions. Just having a little trouble here. The next part is about uh, using the blueprint and uh, I'll uh, first of all introduce the, the focus areas in uh, a little more detail. So you see the, the five focus areas here and a brief statement about the, uh, the aims that we're looking towards uh, to apply good practices in those focus areas. Running through each of the focus areas to give you an idea of the, the recommendations that uh, we, we include. So within policy strat and strategy alignment, we cover the alignment uh, uh, from between location information and digital government strategies. We also look at the alignment between uh, location information policy and, where, and wider data policy. Uh, it has to be, uh, under, location policy has to be undertaken in, in that broader context. Uh, we have some specific guidance on location data pr privacy, and that's uh, proved uh, particularly important in, uh, in recent years with the introduction of GDPR. And we also look at uh, evidence-based policy and how location data fits in there and procurement and the importance of standards in the procurement process. Within digital government integration, uh, this is the, the heart of uh, the, the guidance in relation to uh, integration with digital public services. And we have a recommendation associated with the simplification and transformation of digital public services and improvement actions that can be undertaken uh, in relation to location information and using location intelligence to transform those services. We also have uh, a recommendation seven, uh, which is about the role of spatial data infrastructures and how they can evolve uh, to support the uh, the new dynamics that are developing. And within that, we, uh, we provide uh, some ideas in terms of reviewing uh, SDI policy, developing an action plan. And uh, we look at the recommendation from the perspective of uh, data providers and from the perspective of users. So that is quite a useful collection uh, that you might want to look at. We also describe the, uh, the methodology for open and collaborative development. And uh, we have uh, a topic that relates to the use of location data for statistical purposes, which is an important, uh, important use case uh, to cover within the blueprint. In the area of standardization and reuse, uh, we have recommendations to do with uh, the architectural approach and the use of standards, a recommendation around uh, authentic reference data and the importance of that and linking with uh, broader reference data schemes. We also have uh, a recommendation relating to data quality and some guidance on, on how you might approach that topic. Under return on investment, uh, 
Uh, we uh, cover the important topic of uh, facilitating innovation and the links between uh, public sector and private sector and how public sector data can have a role to play in, uh, in stimulating growth. We also have uh, recommendations relating to monitoring performance and uh, how you go about communicating ben the benefits of, inter of, uh, of, follow of following these good practices, the benefits of location information and uh, how um, it can enrich uh, digital public services. The final area, governance, partnerships and capabilities, has recommendations on the integrated governance approach, on effective partnering, and very importantly, on uh, awareness raising and skills, which was uh, touched on earlier in the, uh, in, in, in the contributions. So uh, you see from all this, from all of these focus areas, all of these recommendations, we have this balanced scorecard approach. In terms of structure, the, uh, the, the blueprint uh, is divided into the, the focus areas and within each focus area, we highlight the, the current state uh, and the, the future vision that we anticipate within that focus area. The current state and the vision are refreshed as we capture information through, for example, the, the LIFO process and the studies we, we under, undertake. So we try to keep that uh, in a dynamic state and as up-to-date as possible. For each of those 19 recommendations, uh, we put together uh, a series of, uh, of checklists explaining firstly why this recommendation, the rationale, then there's a checklist of uh, potential actions to consider, and these are divided into action areas. Uh, the challenges that might be faced, and uh, uh, to give some perspective on, uh, on, on those. The best reference to the best practices that we document within the, uh, uh, within the blueprint. Uh, there are links uh, to the EIF recommendations so that that cross-reference that uh, Federico mentioned can be followed and further reading on the, uh, on the topic. And in some cases, for some topics, there is uh, more detailed guidance than in the blueprint and we provide links to that guidance. So that's the structure. And that structure is paralleled in the, in the LIFO monitoring where we follow this balanced scorecard monitoring approach uh, of actions, recommendations, focus areas, and overall for the LIFO. And we have a hierarchical scorecard uh, where each element at each level uh, has, um, has a corresponding balance to the other elements, with the other elements at that level. I'll now move on to the online version of the blueprint, and uh, this is where I'd encourage you to get started. So put in your search box, Elise Solution Blueprint, and you'll get here to, to this page. Uh, the online version appears on Join Up, and uh, you can uh, interact with the guidance, either pressing the buttons here or following the sidebar links. And, uh, I, what I'll do in this presentation is take you through the buttons on this page and show you parts of the interactive blueprint. So, firstly, in terms of getting started, here you'll see an interactive video, uh, an introductory video. Uh, you'll see uh, an outline of the context to the, the blueprint, which appears in the introduction in the document. And you'll see the summary guidance that I mentioned the blueprint for a user-driven SDI, and uh, some thoughts within there also on the, the current status in Europe on uh, location data in digital government, and some thoughts on future positioning in relation to developments in, in data and digital policy. So that's a good place to get started. Using the blueprint, this uh, part of the blueprint is, uh, is the engine room for the blueprint. 
So you can, from this screen, access the blueprint by focus area or by role. You can see a list of all the recommendations and uh, look at the guidance from that perspective. You can um, review the best practices and the recommendations applied in those best practices. And you can look at the relationships with the EIF. So firstly, accessing the blueprint by focus area. This is an example of what you'll see in terms of the current state assessment and uh, the vision for the focus area. And from here, you can see uh, and select, uh, drill down into each of the recommendations within that uh, focus area. There's also a role-based view and uh, we've looked at those six roles, policy maker, public service owner, ICT manager, et cetera. And uh, we have uh, identified the, the main tasks that might be undertaken within those roles and cross-reference the guidance to those tasks. So if you want to take a, a role-based view in looking at the blueprint, uh, then uh, this is where to go to do that. If you just want to see the recommendations, uh, there is a list of the recommendations and the blueprint, and uh, and you can uh, uh, and you can select the appropriate recommendation that you want to drill down into in detail, and you'll get to this information. So here's a, an extract, a very summary extract, for example, of recommendation six around. Uh, identifying where digital public services can be simplified or transformed using location information and location intelligence and uh, implementing uh, those improvement actions that will uh, add value for users. So we explain why, how, as I've uh, mentioned, the challenges that might be faced. We link to a number of best practices. And in some cases, th there's a, uh, there's, um, a link to several EIS recommendations when, uh, when looking at the from a from the blueprint perspective, and you you'll see a, a list of further reading that we we keep up to date as as new things are discovered. The best practices are now totaling forty nine, and we have those listed, and you can look at each of the best practices and see from those best practices which of the focus areas they reflect and illustrate and which of the recommendations they, they illustrate. And we give you links to those best practices as well. Uh, so some people like to look at the, um, uh, at the guidance in, uh, in uh, recommendation form, in good practice form. Others like to see how that guidance is uh, how those good practices are deployed in actual situations. You have the opportunity within the blueprint to do both. As far as the links to the EIF are concerned, uh, we have uh, from the blueprint side, uh, the, uh, a page here that, uh, that describes the, the, the EIF uh, principles, and layers and conceptual model and the recommendations uh, within each of those parts of the EIF. And, it, and this page shows the correspondence to the, uh, to the EULF blueprint. And from here, you can, uh, uh, you can link to the EIF to look at the solutions in the EIF toolbox that are relevant uh, to, uh, uh, to those recommendations. And uh, you can cross-reference between the two frameworks. You can do something similar if you're an EIF toolbox user. And uh, there is a solution page for the blueprint in the toolbox. You can link uh, to uh, uh, parts of the EULF blueprint from here. Uh, you can see uh, in, in summary form the nature of uh, what the blueprint has to say uh, in relation to those uh, EIF recommendations. And uh, because this is a fairly long list of EIF recommendations, you can, you can, uh, you can also cross check to the, the details within the EIF from this page here as well. 
And, and finally, in this walkthrough, I'll show you the, uh, uh, the, the download, the extra downloads you can get. You can download the Blueprint document, uh, the Blueprint downloads page. And uh, for completeness, we've shown all the uh, uh, versions of the Blueprint and uh, the change history, the additions and revisions that we've uh, developed at each stage. Um, I would encourage you to look at the latest version, but if you, if you do want to know how it's evolved, you can see there. Uh, there's also a further guidance page where the detailed guidance that I mentioned on particular topics is, uh, is included. Finally, I will give you some illustrations in terms of how you might use the guidance in certain situations. So firstly, if you're a general user looking for some guidance on location data good practices, I've talked you through the, um, uh, the, the online uh, presence here, but uh, that's the sort of process that you could go through uh, in starting to use the, the blueprint. You can use the blueprint if, if you're looking to do some overall strategic planning. It can be used in developing a future SDI strategy, for example. Um, and uh, you, can, uh, you can look top down at the, uh, the high level recommendations. Uh, you can use the, the guidance as a checklist in devising your, your strategy. And you can go into particular recommendations uh, I'd recommend two, six, and seven uh, to get some specific guidance on, on overall planning at a strategic level. You can also use the guidance in, uh, in uh, developing uh, an approach on particular location-related topics. I've included an example here in relation to location privacy and uh, how you might uh, access the guidance to, uh, uh, to look at that topic uh, and how you might use the guidance to develop an organizational approach on, uh, on a particular topic and, uh, and how you might, in the, as in this case, um, link uh, to more detailed guidance on the, uh, on, on the tip particular topic outside of the, the blueprint. An important part of the blueprint I mentioned is on skills and awareness raising, and you could use the, the guidance to help you in general terms in looking at good practices on skills and awareness raising, but also the content within the guidance is there for you to draw from in uh, developing your skills and awareness raising programs. So a few examples there on uh, a few illustrations on how to use the guidance. And uh, there are many ways of using it, and it's not prescriptive, but uh, th those are just some ideas. And I'll finish at that point on using the blueprint. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. I think it's, uh, it should be much uh, clearer. Uh, at this point, uh, how to use uh, the blueprint and what are the benefits? Uh, so maybe we can discuss a bit further how to get value uh, from the ULF uh, blueprint, also uh, with some people that have used maybe already. So, uh, uh, in particular in the member states. So, um, first question would be maybe uh, is the is the ULF blueprint uh, a useful tool for for you to care by carrying out uh, certain tasks? And um, if so, if you think it's so, where do you where do you see the added value? Uh, so. Uh, I would maybe challenge this question to Eva Pautnerova from Czechia. Hi Eva, are you here? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Uh, I must tell that uh, I find the uh, evil uh, blueprint uh, as something useful because it uh, bridges uh, in a systematic way gaps uh, which existed between several rather complex domains. And uh, from uh, the perspective of the national uh, mapping and cadastral authority, which is responsible for data, uh, authoritative data for e-government in a continuous uh, regime, 
uh, it was very important that uh, it was a form of framework going beyond the inspire limits which are relevant for some sorts of data and services related to environment but these were not enough for all the products and portfolio of uh, the national mapping agency so we appreciated uh, this uh, formulating and uh, you know, considering of uh, this uh, framework and uh, as uh, the uh, blueprint is based on the generic uh, European interoperability framework it helps to bridge between the location interoperability issues with the uh, principles and uh, interoperability sh issues of public administrations as such. So this is also something which helps to communicate some problems and to find uh, common solutions. So it was positive. And also what I appreciate and what always was told by uh, Thomas uh, Petek that uh, this document is not rigid it's alive and it was able to uh, consider the outputs uh, of uh, discussions around the uh, LIFO pilot and to incorporate new ideas coming for the evol evolving domain so it's good now we have the fourth version and it's still relevant and valid and uh, yeah it helps uh, to compare between countries and naturally to inspire from that from the other countries too and it's something what we uh, like and get the ideas or share the ideas is useful and uh, also uh, several uh, ideas or uh, principles or recommendations which are formulated in this uh, European document help to debate and understand some issues which are solving in particular solutions at the national level to put them uh, relevant uh, standardization shell and to uh, formulate the cooperation between the partners in a formal way which is also relevant for the uh, European interoperability uh, perspective so it helps uh, both ways uh, for internal and also for the European uh, uh, scale so that's in short thank you Thank you very much, Eva, for sharing uh, your views on the on the usability uh, of the blueprint. Uh, Ray mentioned also the guidance. Yes, so uh, uh, maybe a question here regarding the guidance. So does the how how the guidance is usable? Uh, the, does it uh, the, the particular the online one links uh, uh, with the the EIF improve usability? Uh, so, in, in maybe in what ways uh, can this service be improved in the next steps? So, if, uh, for in terms of roles on, or interactive features. So, maybe uh, Gabriele, would you maybe share some thoughts on, on that since you're aware you're using this already okay. as well? Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. And sorry for uh, my voice, but the allergy doesn't uh, keep doesn't help me in, for my commitments. So about your question, uh, I think that the section of the join up website dedicated to youth uh, blueprint is uh, user friendly. Very interesting and uh, useful is the access uh, to the recommendation to focus areas and roles. Uh, I believe that uh, both the five focus areas and the six roles uh, cover uh, the various possibility and uh, the use case, uh, the actual use cases. 
maybe about um, about the about the, the merits of all the contents more careful reflection are uh, perhaps uh, necessary moreover uh, i must also highlight uh, in a particular way the mapping uh, the mapping between health uh, blueprint recommendation with the uh, european interoperability framework principle and uh, related recommendation this aspect uh, in uh, in my opinion adds value to the life of surveys because the result on which uh, can therefore be immediately correlated with the eighth principles also uh, sorry also the mapping between the best practice and the youth recommendation is uh, useful and effective all, um, um, all these and also the immediate vision the links to the various version of the blueprint documents makes the browsing experience in fact, a difference of uh, other online resources available on join up uh, where uh, I always find uh, it uh, difficult to understand the real state of the art, the version and his history of the documents and the guidelines and the links between them. Here in Elf Blueprint area, I easily used the available resources. Here, let me remind you the activity in the ISA working group on spatial information and services for the first version of the blueprint documents. In what ways can the service be improved further? Uh, as I have already said in other circumstances, I believe that it's uh, really important to give more evidence, more importance to the recommendation contained in the blueprint document. I believe they can be formally conveyed, communicated with an official note by ISA to member states. From a practical point of view, however, I think that greater dissemination and communication should be given also to the project partners, the participants to the working group, and the FERALPS also reporting it to each inspired national contact point. I think that this can be useful for the, the development, for the future development of the blueprint. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Gabriele, uh, for uh, for sharing your views and already some some uh, recommendations for the future. Uh, so in the first part, uh, we were um, asking uh, also relating also to the smart communities. So would maybe um, also Andrea uh, give some let's say uh, view here on how the guidance may be useful here on or what enhancement maybe will be of added value here. Oh, Andrea was disconnected, I think. Uh, so I will I will repeat later the question for her, to her. Uh, what about Ricardo? Ricardo, maybe from from your from your point of view. Or oh, Andrea is here. Is back. Sorry. I hope you heard the question. That was yes. Uh, uh, yes, I'm really sorry. I had some connection issues. But indeed, I think uh, the question was around the usefulness of. Uh, of the tool, right? First, yes, might see. the guidance and uh, about potential enhancement uh, that may bring uh, exactly. Under... So I think the tool it looks uh, very promising and and could could be very useful for cities. And I I think we could look at ways how to promote it more to cities, for example, through the Living in EU uh, community, which, as you know, brings together cities who are trying to go through their digital transformation. Uh, in a way that very much corresponds to the to the principles and and the recommendations that are behind uh, the blueprint. So I think we could look into ways of promoting it through the, the group that works on capacity building of cities. Now to make it even more useful, I I would like to um, uh, conquer to the messages that were uh, or that have been said earlier that it's going to probably be some kind of a living document and it may need to recognize some of the forthcoming uh, activities such as the high value data sets so the there will be questions on how uh, the high value data sets that are uh, for example those related to geospatial data will be relevant at the local level or will be available will be readily 
uh, usable for cities. And I think that would be interesting. We also, I think cities would also uh, like to see some recommendations very concretely on how do, to best share um, data from business to government. So how to get, you know, use data that is location data that may not uh, essentially be uh, with, the, with government. Um, but also how to create portable services. And I think what could be useful for cities is to have examples uh, that uh, relate to, for example, digital twins, local digital twins, where the basis will surely be related to location data, two or three D models of cities. And I think that would uh, kind of uh, be quite relevant to cities who are uh, in the process of, of uh, exploring this possibility and the commission will support cities to create their local digital twins. So that would be very useful. And um, indeed, uh, as I said, uh, all of this work would be very, very useful for the creation of a data space, so a data sharing environment, whereby location data will have a big role to play. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, uh, for this, uh, for your thoughts. Uh, in the meantime, I see that uh, uh, Ricardo was nodding uh, most of the time while Andrea was speaking. So please, Ricardo, I'm pretty sure that you have something to add here as well. No, I absolutely agree. Uh, the best practice that we helped creating was the use case with the city of Guimarães, published last year, thanks to uh, Ray and Clementine for reaching out. Uh, and indeed, we are helping the city create a digital twin of what's happening at the street level. So uh, if other cities can learn from what the, the, the city of Kimaranj uh, has, has learned uh, and evolved, I believe that even for the resilience and recovery facility, it might be good for the reskill and upskill on learning how to use digital tools and leverage on open standards to uh, ensure this interoperability. But not, not only public authorities, even the industry can learn because while we were using location intelligence data for uh, measuring traffic, uh, cities have the real context of their streets, of their communities, of their uh, uh, region. So while we can collect data from uh, IoT devices, vehicles, satellites, and so on, uh, some of this data uh, needs uh, rich metadata, needs to be improved, needs to be uh, adapted to the context. And this context, this useful context, comes from the, the public authorities. So as long as we support and enable these co-creation uh, mechanisms, uh, we will all win, both the public authorities who will get uh, better tools and, and data, and also the industry will improve the, the data that they can provide for multiple stakeholders, uh, industry and research, of course, not just uh, uh, the industry. Uh, thank you, Simon, and I hope this, this was useful. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Ricardo. I've seen there were quite many questions in the meantime in the chat box appearing. Uh, maybe we'll address some of them at uh, this point. Um, I think uh, there is uh, one question here regarding the um, Elise uh, analyzing the integration between the blueprint and uh, the uh, UPSI directive. Maybe Lorena, would you uh, answer that question? Yes, uh, thank you. I think it was Ricardo no, who was uh, asking this question. Uh, thank you for uh, the comment. I, I think that's actually a brilliant idea. I think uh, also uh, Ray uh, probably will uh, will share this with me because, um, I mean, it, I, I, first of all, because geospatial is one of the geospatial uh, of the thematic categories that are recognized by the high value data sets, and I think it fits very well, but also because uh, um, these high value data sets uh, are subject to particular rules for ensuring their availability, like uh, being in machine readable formats or being uh, shared through application programming interfaces. And I think that they fit very well with some of the recommendations and that are in, in some of the focus areas that are uh, already available in the, in the blueprint. So uh, to me, it uh, has definitely sense to, uh, to, to integrate it there. Okay, thank you very much, Lorena, for that. Ray, would you like to add up anything on that? Uh, I mean, yes. I mean, uh, thank you all for the uh, for for the comments and and the feedback. I mean, I'll certainly take note on the communications and promotion aspects. And uh, in terms of um, in terms of uh, relating to the data strategy and the PSI uh, developments. Uh, we've already captured what uh, we were aware of in uh, in the middle of last year, 
and that whole area is is developing very rapidly. Um, we've already, for the LIFO 2020, added questions on high value data sets and availability of APIs. So we're starting to capture information there, and uh, we hope to develop the uh, uh, the knowledge base and the, and the guidance uh, further to to help in the uh, in the data strategy development and supporting the data spaces. And uh, we've already started to, uh, uh, to place much more emphasis on smart communities and uh, uh, local, uh, and, uh, local uh, uses of location data, as, uh, as Ricardo mentioned. And uh, again, uh, the, uh, uh, the areas that uh, Andrea touched on uh, we uh, we already have uh, covered to to a certain degree, uh, and uh, we see that as very much as a as a uh, as an area of development for the future. So thank you for those comments. Okay, thank you. So maybe to the next question. So Ula asked about the uh, who should could use the blueprint. Uh, so Ula was the the uh, answer. And so do your question answered through the main course of this webinar today, or we do expect something more? No, first of all, thank you again for, for arranging these interesting uh, webinars. It's, it's very useful. Now, what I was heading at is, is uh, it's really important to understand that you can use this blueprint on a lot of levels, like decision maker CIOs to, down to, down to, uh, to the, the IT developer. So um, I was only I was only um, searching for a bit more words on that. That is actually very practical too. So thank you so far. Thank you, thank you, Ulla. Uh, I think um, uh, Auntie, you had also some some questions and comments. Can you maybe summarize so that maybe Ray can answer it to you? Yeah, thank you for for the opportunity. Um, well, I was asking uh, questions related to the, some of the examples, which I, I thought that some of them seem to be rather old. I was viewing one example that was from 2010. So it doesn't uh, look when when you look that kind of example, then then probably you're not interested to read further. Um, then I was I, I was uh, also thinking that these digital twins, uh, Kaya X, etc., are interesting developments. And 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 my question was that have you kind of considered them already in the current version? Coming in quickly on that one, Antti. Um, yes, uh, I uh, I did show some of the early examples uh, online. Um, if you looked at examples, uh, uh, best practices 40 to 49, you'd see uh, the, the more recent ones. And in fact, uh, in the, the last update of the blueprint uh, during last year, uh, we introduced 19 new best practices, including uh, a digital twin example. And uh, we've worked uh, very closely with Helsinki on, on, on that in uh, certain Elise studies and we incorporated the, the, the headlines from uh, those activities in a best practice in, in the blueprint. And we certainly hope to do more on digital twins. Uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, developments we know in, in, in that field. So yeah, we've started, certainly. Okay, thank you, Ray. I think we went through the most, as I see, questions, and it will be time now maybe to switch to the dessert uh, before we close uh, the webinar. It is a, we are a bit longer today. The topic is quite broad and wide, so excuse us maybe that we are maybe running a bit over uh, usual 60 minutes. So please, Ray, continue. Uh, yeah, I've, I've just got a couple of slides on conclusions and, and next steps. I, I mean, firstly, in, in conclusions, um, I, I, you know, I did want to uh, lay out the, the uniqueness of the, the blueprint and how those different elements combine together to, to make it uh, unique. Um, the user-driven nature, its interoperability focus, uh, it's a guidance framework rather than a, a purely strategic framework. It's digital government focus, it's European context, 
uh, the way you can use the blueprint, the fact that it's dynamic and we keep it up to date and we use it for benchmarking. So th th those are the features of the blueprint that make it unique. Um, it does have that uh, strategic basis and uh, it can be used to answer tactical questions as well. And it can be used as a gateway to, to, to other information. And, and the way we've designed it is to enable more uh, links, more uh, information to be added in, in the future. And uh, it's, it's not a storybook, it's a toolbox. There's no one size fits all in any situation, in any member state, in any organization. And this is good practice that, uh, uh, that wasn't invented for the blueprint. Uh, the blueprint for the blueprint, we're assembling that good practice uh, from observing it and, and, and researching it. And so, yes, it's to be used uh, selectively for the different questions that you want to answer. And we designed the blueprint in such a way that you can take a top down view and go down as far as you want in terms of detail to help you answer your questions. Uh, but I'm only saying this, uh, so see for yourself and uh, see what the blueprint can, can offer and go online and, and have a look if you haven't done already. So that's where we are today. Um, in the remainder of Elise, we, we have uh, a number of ideas on the table of uh, how we'd like to, uh, uh, to do a further revision this year. And uh, we'd certainly like to incorporate the, the, uh, the LIFO 2020 findings, both in terms of an update on the state of play and uh, any new best practices, and particularly those in areas that have been mentioned. There are uh, developments in European data and digital policy that, uh, and smart communities developments uh, where we will uh, certainly uh, look at those and introduce some headlines in, in the blueprint, if not lots of detail. Uh, there's some remaining studies and activities in Elise and we'll see uh, what they offer and cross-reference those in the blueprint. And we, we'd like to uh, improve the inter interactive links as well. Um, we're planning some developments on LIFO this year in terms of interactive capabilities. So we'll link to those from the blueprint. Uh, we'll certainly uh, like to add links to the Elise studies and training resources uh, uh, as Elise draws to a close. And uh, if we get the, the opportunity, it, we feel it would be very useful to, uh, uh, to link across to the UNGGIM IGIF framework and uh, see how that maps onto the blueprint. So that's uh, quite a big shopping list and hopefully uh, most of that we can accomplish this year. L looking forward, uh, the uh, the Digital Europe programme will uh, be a feature of many of our lives going forward. Uh, we've already started planning a successor reaction to Elise, which is called Elite, and are thinking about what that might include in 2021-22. Within, uh, uh, within the Digital Europe programme, uh, an evolution of a uh, revision of the EIF is envisaged and uh, the, we will look to see what that offers in terms of possibilities for the, uh, for the blueprint as well. We will uh, look at ways of, uh, of enhancing the interactive presence, um, links with the EIF toolbox. Uh, there is a smart communities uh, framework uh, based on the EIF, which is be which is uh, being developed. And uh, you know, there's potential there uh, to give a location data perspective and to link with, uh, with that. Um, we'd like to see what the users of the blueprint uh, view as important priority areas for guidance. And maybe there's things on data spaces, on smart communities, on, on citizen generated data, possibly other things that we might look into further. Skills is going to be particularly important going forward. So we envisage uh, contributions to the Interoperability Academy. And for LIFO, uh, we have a LIFO in 2020, 
and uh, we, uh, we 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 envisage uh, LIFO going forward as part of the Digital Europe program, and it would be very good to get a further update in the let's say in 2022 and to get more best practices captured and uh, to enhance the tools further so that uh, not only the blueprint but also LIFO uh, alongside the blueprint can uh, be a, a much more effective uh, a, a much more effective tool so those are some of the uh, things that uh, we're thinking about uh, but certainly interested in in your views Simon? Great, thank you. Sorry, I was, I was muted yet. Uh, so yes, we came to the uh, section number seven, uh, actually with this, to the some, let's say, final, final thoughts. And um, uh, there was quite a, a lot on the table today for digest, I think, but very useful things, I believe. I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, maybe any further comments from the from the attendees? So there I see there is a question from Auntie. When you would expect to have leave for 2020 findings available? Ray, Ray I think that's a question direct to you. Uh, yes, uh, I mean we're we're currently assembling the information, and uh, it should be published and presented during the summer. Thank you, uh, Ray. Uh, so maybe. Um, before we uh, sign off today, um, to have some views as well uh, from our previous speakers about the future. Uh, let's say, uh, what support do you need in the future uh, from uh, frameworks like Blueprint? So what topics would be important for you to address? You've seen some, some suggestions, some shopping lists already uh, on, the, on, the, on the previous slides. Uh, so maybe I don't know, Eva Tomash, would you would you add anything uh, on top of that what you have shared uh, uh, with us? Maybe Tomash, I see you are you're here still. Please. Uh, yes, thank you, Simon, and uh, also thank you, Ray. Uh, I must uh, agree with all what you already explained and show us. And uh, maybe if you allow me, I want just to add. Uh, that now we are in the middle of the process of uh, going into this uh, realization of European digital strategy and uh, the location data and services are the important part of this. And as uh, Ray already mentioned, uh, we uh, need uh, uh, or we could use the ELF uh, blueprint as a quite significant indicator if uh, we are on the right way and how far a particular member states uh, realize this uh, common goal to achieve in practice the pan-European, uh, especially semantic interoperability and harmonization. For those reasons, I uh, would like to uh, express my opinion regarding this uh, many of strategic European strategic plans and activities within the next financial perspective when we would like to implement this uh, environmental green deal uh, data space, uh, which will include also the review of INSPIRE uh, directive and also the uh, realize the federated data infrastructure uh, as one of the horizontal European uh, Union program. And all these uh, are a call uh, directly that we need to update uh, also the uh, blueprint as a live document, uh, which will uh, help us to achieve this synergy synergy between all these programs and uh, on the national and the regional uh, level. And the last but not least, uh, Ray already mentioned the integrated geospatial information framework where on the regional committee of United Nations group of ex experts for uh, global geospatial information management uh, uh, are dealing with uh, the guiding document which uh, addressed almost the same uh, nine strategic pathways which we already speak uh, uh, about today uh, from data to innovation to standards policy and uh, governance but the most important is capacity and education and also communication engagement and these two uh, areas are already now covered in uh, ULF uh, blueprint and I believe that we 
all uh, together uh, are looking forward that um, also the future development of European interoperability give us some uh, confirmation, also guiding uh, uh, recommendation in in that way. As I say, uh, this is some kind of indicator of uh, achieving those, uh, let's say, a goal of uh, European uh, semantic interoperability. So thank you for my set. Thank you too much for this uh, for sharing these views, um, particularly very useful and also suggestions and, and links with, uh, with, uh, with the frameworks like uh, IGF as well. Uh, Eva, would you uh, like to say anything on top of that, please? Yeah, so at first, thanks for this uh, interesting uh, webinar and also for involving these feedbacks from countries. Uh, to think about the future, I was pleased to see in uh, the uh, last uh, presentations uh, or slides from Ray that there are the plans uh, for the next stage of the digital Europe. Uh, so that uh, the activities started in ISA and ISA 2 will go on. So thanks for that. Uh, when I think from the national perspective, I'm aware that uh, there are barriers or limits concerning the usage, implementation usage of this document, which are based on uh, uh, the foreign language. For many people, it's not common to read such documents as the European uh, hundred pages uh, materials, many of them with different contexts, to read them in addition to their everyday tasks within public administration. Maybe in some other countries it's not a problem. I am thinking it's an issue which makes a barrier to communicate the document not only within a group of interested people who are interested in cross-border and holistic approaches. It's uh, a document which uh, should be broadly recognized and used. So at the moment, it's limited. And the other challenge which I see is that uh, the uh, ISA is for and all these activities are focused on cross-border solutions. And when I look at it from the location information perspective, we are still in the pilot stage. I mean, not the Czech Republic, I mean, everybody. When we try something as a project, it stops because there is nobody who at the end would be able to provide a joint stable infrastructure which should enable cross-border solutions. And I think it's something what should be studied, analyzed in the further stage of uh, uh, the ELISA or elite activities how to overcome this. And if not, we still go on with being with pilots, I'm afraid. And uh, when I'm asking these questions myself, I'm also asking myself, isn't that the limitation of a generation? Maybe it is, but when it is the cross generation semantics or interoperability should be considered as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eva, for raising these uh, two very important issues. So the cross-border aspect and um, multilinguality, which uh, becomes uh, can quite an issue when you're approaching, when we are approaching uh, local and regional uh, levels of governments. Uh, both, I think, may be quite relevant as well for the smart cities communities. Uh, would Andrea, maybe you uh, like to add anything on top of that for the future? 
I, uh, I agree with what uh, has been said indeed for smart cities. I think uh, I also wanted to pick up on the comment that Ray mentioned that one of the other elements that you may want to look into will be on the use of or how to address personal data management in the context of using um, uh, location intelligence, because that's something that's, of course, very, very interesting and um, quite a concern for, for cities and communities and it will be a big concern both for the data space um, discussions and for the digital twin discussion. And since Ray has already mentioned uh, 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 the, the possibilities under digital, I wanted to also just mention that in the digital Europe program, indeed in the first two years of the work program, there will be uh, some commission funding available to, uh, to support the creation of a data space for climate neutral and smart communities, where again, uh, I believe, and some of the previous workshops have confirmed that location intelligence will be important. We will also have uh, the possibility to help uh, cities procure interoperable uh, platforms to manage the data. And we will um, pull together um, reusable tools and, and, and solutions for something called a, um, a toolbox for uh, local digital twins that cities could use if they want to implement their digital twins. And here again, as I said, I think location intelligence will have a really important role to play. So something to look forward to in the, when the, the, the work program and the course are published. Thank you Thank very you. much Andre, for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, so before uh, uh, informing you, before concluding this discussion and informing you with some further information about the, the, the events, I would maybe invite also Francesco Pignatelli, sort of the, as I mentioned in the beginning, Elisa Action Leader, for sharing with us uh, his final thoughts, maybe, please, Francesco. Uh, thank you, um, Yvonne. I would like uh, to give just final, uh, first of all, to thank everybody for the active participation, also for my, my colleagues for putting together this webinar. Uh, and uh, I would like to just to echo what uh, Andrea said, uh, we are working together in, uh, in the table of the Commission, uh, GRC, Digit, and Connect, to be sure that in the Digital Europe program, we will have a very close coordination among the various uh, uh, DGs. And uh, in fact, Elise is part of the interoperability program, ISA, ISA Square. And this, uh, you, as you know, this is the last year. So there will be uh, some contracts still running but we are moving towards the digital Europe program. Elise will be, uh, will be uh, continuing under a new name, let's say it will be called European Location Intelligence and Technological Enablers, and uh, so Elite. And basically we will continue most of the activities that uh, we are doing now, but also we will move towards the goal of modernization uh, of the public administration, which is really important together with the Green Deal, also at political level now for the recovery and resilience plan. So whatever we can do to improve uh, uh, the public administration efficiency is welcome. And there are a lot of questions, uh, research questions that we are uh, addressing to ourselves that I think will be important for the future. Uh, there will be an AI legal framework. Uh, you know that the, the AI use the impact in public services is, is more and more important, but we also have to address and to understand the high risk of using these uh, AI tools. And also we have to face the fact that it would be a post-pandemic society. So the, 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 the type of, the, the, the way we are working and we are behaving will, will, will change. And the impact of, the, of COVID will not be the same. Uh, will not uh, remain the things like there were before. Also, we are thinking about the new models to provide innovative digital public services. Also the role of citizen uh, in an algorithmic democracy, let's say. Uh, to be sure that uh, not only, uh, you know, uh, we are driven by technological, uh, you know, company, but also we, we, can, uh, we can really control uh, the overall uh, system. Coming back to this webinar, I would like to tell you that it's important. Uh, as uh, we said, uh, also ever underlined, the, the blueprint is an alive document. There are things that become more important that we try to consider 
in a different, let's say, in a various stage and with a different uh, uh, update of the document. So it's important that this uh, document is as difficult in most of the framework is that for them to find the uh, nice, uh, friendly applicability, let's say. So it's important to have your uh, community, the community that we created with your space of solution on board also after the end of this uh, ISA program. So we will try to do something also for Elite. It's important to keep in touch with, uh, with you, with the user, with the member states, to receive your feedback, your help. And uh, that's what we are trying to do now. So all our documents for the moment that are part of the knowledge transfer that Simon and Lorena are really, uh, let's say, um, involved uh, full time on this, try to, to, you know, to promote all the work we are doing, which is not, you know, always easy. Uh, so we are creating uh, all our documentation and the uh, and, uh, result and outputs are on join up, but also we have created now a new location uh, channel on YouTube where we can, we have stored all our uh, webinars. So if you, if you miss some of the webinars, you can have, uh, uh, you can do, you know, offline. And also this webinar will be recorded, they will be uploaded, uh, is recorded, will be uploaded there. And we will uh, we will keep you in touch. So it's important for me that we don't lose, you know, connection. I know Simon is very uh, active in this, uh, in touch with all of you. So uh, we are finishing a journey, but this is just a step. I would like to say that we will be uh, together also in the future. And I would like to thank you again uh, for, for, for your involvement today. Um, Simo, you want to maybe announce uh, the next step and some uh, events which are important. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Francesco, for this nice uh, conclusion of today's discussion and the webinar. So because we are signing off, uh, let's uh, share with you a few information about the next ELISA webinars that are coming up in the April, May and June. So in the third week of April, we are planning the, the three ELISA webinars, giving an overview on ELISA outputs by the objective areas that were mentioned at the beginning of the webinar today. And in May and June, we are preparing uh, two webinars on energy efficiency and location and uh, another two, one on registry and the another one on reference validator. Uh, so, uh, but there is uh, another event that will be very much important in the next month, uh, a digital event, a digital public conference, uh, which is the joint event of ISA Square and CIF uh, actions. And uh, you, you have a link here where you can already start uh, registering. So at this point, I would like to thank you. Thank you, Ray, for the presentation. Thank you all that uh, participated today uh, uh, this webinar and also to all that commented, uh, uh, raised questions uh, and uh, hold the discussion. So as it was said, uh, to stay tuned, you can uh, uh, see at the next slide, uh, we have some resources. It's a join up <coughs> Elisa page. Uh, it's a Twitter account. We have our email and as Francesco already said, Elisa playlist. So thank you very much and see you at the next webinar.